Happy Sabbath. I need to start with prayer. Father, your words, your desires, your very intention that this, the stories shared today connect the dots of a big picture that, that only you can do. So may you be glorified is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. How many of you are ready, packed, and excited about going to camp meeting? I'm all excited now. <laughs> well, let me just add to your excitement. The decision has been made that nobody can drive there. Everybody has to walk. How many is excited about camp meeting now? And there's, not a, there's not another hand now. Okay. In fact, now, it'd be one thing, maybe, to walk to old-time camp meeting. How many miles would that be? 30? 30? Anyway, College Dell? Farther. <laughs> okay. So if, if you knew that in advance, and you say, hmm, if I had to walk to College Dell, how many days would you start early? You're already shaking your head no. Like, I don't, I don't even want to have to consider those thoughts. It's fascinating that in the time of the Jewish nation, everything evolved around Passover. And everybody walked there. And so the planning of that event became huge. In other words, how many of you like family reunions? Yeah, yeah, everybody likes it. Yeah, even young people do. And the idea of planning a family reunion for us isn't too difficult because people can drive there and even fly in from across the United States and, and accomplish that goal. But to gather a family together as a Jewish nation back then, you timed it with Passover. A wedding took place. The invitations probably might have even been sent out the previous Passover. So that all the family that was at Passover would say, well, next year, Brother Joe's daughter and that other guy that we're waiting to meet, they're actually getting married next Passover and we're going to get together just before Passover, because we will have walked 75 miles, and I'm really looking forward to being at that wedding feast that's just before Passover. Are y'all getting the picture? The fascinating thing is the reason I'm sharing this story and introducing it this way is because the writer, John, was the only one of the four gospel writers that picked up on this point that the events around Passover became huge because Becky and I was doing a study one evening and we started comparing our notes from John and then was looking at this amazing commentary book. You may have heard of it. It's by the title, The Desire of Ages. And, and to connect the events of that wedding feast with the Passover, there was a, an amazing trivia that was stated there, and we just never did look at it that way because we could look at camp meeting and say, in fact, we even prayed today at camp meeting, praying for those that are speaking, praying for those that are listening, and we could add to the prayer request, praying for those that are responding by going home and sharing what they learned at camp meeting to their family members. Amen? So, this is what happened at Passover time. It wasn't just the people that came to Passover because she told us that at, after that wedding feast, well, let's look it up here. This is the simple thing. This is John chapter 2. This is the first time it happens. John 2, verse 13. And this is immediately following this amazing miracle that happened at 
a wedding. Because the family has come in for Passover, and there's this, uh, like a pit stop that's before Passover is a wedding. And the wedding has taken place. Jesus turns the water into wine, and that's the best wine of the whole uh, wedding feast. And then here we pick up here in verse 13. This is John 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So Jesus, the disciples, the, 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 everybody that was at the wedding left there and went to the Passover. So here's the little statement that she makes in the des book, Desire of Ages. The conversation at Passover was what had just happened at the wedding. Camp meeting got the biggest children's story they ever could have imagined, you know, at Passover, a time when the reminding of that blood put on the doorpost and that angel passed over and the statement was made, we believe in the blood of the Lamb. People went to Passover, talked about the wedding. They left Passover. They went, and anybody in the Jewish nation that had not heard of Jesus knew the words out. So, second Passover. People are coming into town. They're walking hundreds of miles. You got the picture? So does anybody happen to know, let's see by a show of hands first, what event happened immediately before the next Passover? Let's see a show of hands. Anybody know? What event happened? I see one hand. Another hand. Okay, y'all need to have these things in your memory. John, like I said, that was the only one that referred to this. We could actually go to where he says the reference of the Passover part. It's in John chapter 6 and verse 4. John 6, 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And there, you're looking there in John 6, and you're realizing, oh, there was an amazing miracle that happened here. What happened? He fed the 5,000. All of these people had been traveling in, walking. I love saying camp meeting, but it was Passover. They've walked to this amazing meeting. Everybody had to go to it. And they were coming together. She even tells us they were seeking the what that they had heard about at the past Passover. They were seeking Jesus. And they found him on a hillside. And there was a big crowd. And everybody got fed. That bread was broken. Oh, I can I tell you what, I just wish more than anything I could have been a disciple that was standing there and Jesus was breaking the bread and the fish and, and I had my basket. You, you picture yourself with a basket and, and I'm thinking... What am I doing with this big basket? And he's taking stuff out of a little paper bag. You know, I've got a big basket here. And I'm looking at 5,000 plus people, maybe 10,000 people and child, with children, you know. And I've got my basket and he's got a little lunch. I, what am I doing with this basket? And he puts, he blesses it. I might say that a few more times. He blesses it. When God blesses something, you better get ready for something, you know? And so he blessed it and broke it. And he lays this little clump in my basket. <laughs> zoom. I'm just curious, where are you seeing the zoom? In your basket or between your ears? Both. 
Amen. And so I've got my basket. And it's heavy now. Now what are you going to try and do with your basket? Trying to carry it. Please make my basket lighter and take some of the food. Please take some. Please, please take some. I feel like a pastor in the last day saying, please take some. I feel like a member of this church. Please take some of the bread of life. And I can't empty my basket. And if anything, it's getting fuller. And I come back after everybody's had their fill. There's a new statement for what a mouthful. And I can't empty my basket. And I come back and all 12 of us are looking at each other like, yours is still full too. What is the deal? When we're talking blessed, we're talking blessed. Trivia number three. Does anybody know the next Passover? What was the next amazing miracle that happened just before the next Passover? Amen. It's stated there in John 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. The story, he goes to Bethany because who lives there? Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Six days before Passover, there has been just an event happened of the raising of Lazarus from the, from the dead. The criers are silenced. He had to say the name Lazarus or else everybody would have come from the grave. And now there is this setting of all the people that are walking in for Passover. There's a whole new rumor going on. Because, and the results is, once this rumor gets around that Lazarus has been raised from the dead, and guess who did it? Well, the guy that fed us by the, that group, remember last year, Passover? And the one that turned the water to the wine the year before that? He, he now has raised somebody from the dead. And they come in for Passover with palm branches. Because a transition has happened. There's somebody finally connecting dots. There are many times, Jesus used this phrase, and I've said it before, but I can't help but say it again. When Jesus was in conversation or in prayer with His Father, He would turn to the disciples or turn to who he's saying, and he would say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. That word verily in the Greek means amen. He would start his conversation with those around him with amen. We close our prayers with it. He would close his conversation with his father saying, Amen, amen, Father. I'll now share with them what you just taught me. Jesus himself was in school. Just as we are today. But the Father himself was desiring to teach an entire nation that when they came to Passover, if you will just partake of the grape juice, if you'll just partake of his living blood. Don't focus on the death. Because the results of taking the living blood and his broken body is taking in him. I'm offering you a whole new life. And here is a living example. His name is Lazarus. That's why he was leading the donkey as it went into the city. They came to see Lazarus and Jesus. There was a combination now of what they came to see at Passover. A combination of man and eternal. This is why John, 
I really believe this with all my heart. I really believe that young teenager, John, took a hold of a picture that I don't think the others got. He got excited about this in 1 John where he says, we've handled it, we've heard it, we've experienced the eternal life. He couldn't have pinned those words until after the resurrection. And Lazarus began that flow of thinking that there is life after death. In fact, it gets pretty exciting. We don't even have to think about death. It should not be in our vocabulary. Jesus tried His best to not allow it in His. He says, it's just sleep. Oh, He's just sleeping. He's just sleeping. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, you guys. He's dead. That's the only way you're going to be able to get this picture. i got to say the word. A message. This is the big picture statement. I want to make sure you're hearing this today. Because somebody told me, how come you speak in parables so much? Please. My prayer is you connect the dots here. God Himself used the, an event that all of the Jewish nation came together. He gave them a message to be spread not just immediately to a small group coming to church, but to the entire Jewish nation. If you'll just accept my son, I will give you life. Amen. Amen. So as we break up to go to our different rooms to wash our feet, you're claiming by that act of washing feet you're making an open statement that I believe what Jesus did for me on the cross was good enough. It was good enough to take old me and take it to the grave and leave it there. And we will come back into this sanctuary empty of us and desiring to be filled with Him. Him. 